Hey, I'm Peter Kyoto. Welcome to the Flying Monkeys, artisan brewer. I'm a lion tamer. I'm whatever you want to call me. Come on into my brewery. So here we are in the wonderful store at Flying Monkeys. Uh, there's nobody here. It must be three in the morning when we're videotaping because usually it's pretty packed. Uh, this is where all the magic begins. So let's go into the brew house. We got lots of surprises today. So. We have Seb here. Seb is our wonderful experimental brewer. Hello. And what are you brewing today, Seb? Uh, today we're doing a gingerbread winter warmer. A gin gingerbread? But it's summer. Why would you do a gingerbread in the middle of summer? Uh, we gotta be prepared for winter. Ah. Comes up fast. Gotta be ahead of the game. So we're doing this. Well, what are these guys doing here? Who are these guys? Uh, these are a couple home brewers who came in and uh, brewing today with me. Oh, so that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the things we like to do is bring in a lot of home brewers, bring in other artisan brewers that uh, help the greater cause of craft beer, I guess, eh? Well, let me ask you a question. So this is our pilot brewery here at Flying Monkeys. How many pilot brews do you do a week? Uh, between four and eight, depending on how many other things I have to do or how, what we have coming up, I guess, demand. So. so as a founder of Flying Monkeys, it sounds like you're overworked and underpaid. Is that correct? Yes. It's like true. everybody else. Welcome to craft beer. Let's move on. I started uh, with my grandfather, I guess, was back in the uh, late 70s. I did, did my first brew with him, uh, but truly got into craft brewing in grad school, like probably most people, you know, money's sort of scarce, and uh, started back in the early 90s. Actually, it was, I think, 1991 I started brewing. My first taste of Sierra Nevada, and that kind of put me on the right track. I used to, buy, used to buy ingredients from Memphis, so it was fun back then. Kitchen top brewing. I get asked, you know, what are my goals, you know, what, what do we want to grow into or grow up to be? And uh, really, it's just all about freedom. And the more uh, bigger you get, the more experiments you get to try. And that's really what it's all about. It's, at the end of the day, the money will come if you're passionate about what you do. And for us, just being able to experiment with everything, I mean, or anything, is a lot more fun. Being able to do collaborations, being able to go places that have pretty cool breweries, anything. Uh, that's beer related. Everything in my life revolves around beer, whether it be family vacations to uh, anything creatively that I see out there, I somehow say, how can it help me make better beer and put a different product on the shelf? Come on over here, we'll go to the brew house. Hey, here's Paul. Paul. Hey, hello. This is Paul Buttery. Paul Buttery is our head brewer. Paul's been with me, uh, well, uh, since three the beginning. Years. Three, over three years. Over actually. three years. And, uh, what do you got going on here, by the way? I thought I'd ask. I know it, it looks, looks, uh, looks looks pretty messy. <laughs> uh, we're filtering popsicle today, as well as smash bomb later this afternoon. So this is actually our new filter machine that we just got uh, working. Oops, uh, just back in June. Ooh. So yeah, that's uh, nice. What's your longest brew day here, Flying Monkey? Or, or should it say <laughs> brew days? Brew days. Um, yeah. I think when I first started here, it was one of the longest ones I ever had. Um, my first week here because I brewed with you and then one of our other brewers that was here when I started. Uh, I think it was 18, 20 hours. Um, any, any longer brews in terms of days for brewing? Oh yeah, uh, so when we do some of our big beers like uh, Matador, we did a BNL, we did City and Color, some of those big high alcohol beers, uh, because they're 10, 11, 12% alcohol, you normally do 5 or 6%. So we're talking about double the amount of alcohol, which means double the amount of grain and double the amount of sugar, uh, and that takes time. Well, collaborations are something that, like most ideas in a brewery, they usually start out with a, some sort of sampling session, whether it be in my office or wherever else, where we start drinking a lot of beers and generate ideas. And that one came when we were drinking some Bitches Brew from Dogfish Head. I think it was Bitches Brew. And uh, we said, well, let's not just do a tribute beer, let's do a beer that we can bring the artists in there and get them involved in the brewing process. And sure enough, we said, let's. Uh, spray out to a couple of uh, cool Canadian artists that we'd like to brew with. And the Very Naked Ladies were at the top of our list. So when they agreed, it was phenomenal. And we brought them in, we did some sampling, and uh, like most people, you know, they don't, you're, you're learning about beer as you go along, and the more you get into it, uh, the better you get at it. And we decided upon a chocolate beer, which was sort of in, kind of uh, in the spirit of who the Bare Naked Ladies were. 
yeah, we've done some, uh, some pretty wild experiments. We've, uh, like I said, when we did BNL, we added uh, cocoa nibs right to the tank, and uh, similar to dry hopping. So we'll we'll get up on the tanks. We have ports in the tanks that we can get up on, drop the hops in. We also like I said, we so you'll drop, drop ingredients right into the fermenter. We drop ingredients right in the fermenters, and uh, for uh, I, I think I remember with the cocoa nibs that it all got jammed up in the Yeah, we, we kind of didn't think about it. We thought, oh, it's probably about the size of hops. It'll probably work out really, really well. But uh, yeah, they didn't want to come out of the tanks, so it was a bit of a chore. <laughs> it was a bit of a chore to get them out. Um, so we kind of learned our lesson that time. When we do collaborations, we invite the artists to the brewery for a tour. And in the City and Color uh, brew, Dallas came up to the brewery and we started sampling at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon and I think by about 10.30 at night after uh, a lot of sampling, a lot of different beers, we finally came up with something that was going to be maple based, a little bit of Canadiana and uh, it was going to be high gravity and, and uh, that was kind of what Dallas sort of and I, we, we kind of zoned in on. He wanted something that was different, that was beyond just a lager and something high gravity and flavorful and that's how we came up with the City and Color Maple Wheat. For City and Color, we actually got uh, almost 20 pounds of actual real vanilla beans. I brought my food processor in from home, and we uh, literally pulsed them and chopped them up into small bits, and we put fresh vanilla beans straight into the tanks, and uh, it's amazing. Within 24 hours, you could taste vanilla on the beer. It was awesome. I think anything high gravity above 16% alcohol is, is very appealing to me in terms of my favorite beers. I, I can look at Tokyo, I can look at Worldwide Stout, I can look at Dark Lord, which is a little bit lower than that, but anything like in that genre of, uh, of a darker, sweeter stout, big texture, big flavor, something with legs on the glass. And that's kind of what we're looking for in Divinity, which is one of our experiments that we'll hopefully be coming out with next year. I've been working on it now for four years, this 18% beer, and, and we really haven't got it to the point where we're ready to release it yet. We've done a lot of sample batches. It'll be a Russian Imperial. It'll be a big, big, big boy. Probably the biggest boy in Ontario. And, and in order to put something like that out in the market, we have to, we had to have a spirits license as well that allows us to brew over 12%. In Ontario, you're only allowed to brew up to 12% as a brewery. I don't think there are any limits on what we can brew, what we can do. I mean, we're experimenting with all sorts of woods, barrels from around the world. We brought barrels in from Spain, from uh, Barbados, rum barrels. Uh, you know, white wine barrels, you name it, anything, in, in my view at least, the, uh, the canvas is wide open for any type of brewing art. I, I preach the gospel of craft in general in Ontario, not necessarily just flying monkeys, so I'd be happy if you have, uh, you know, a Miami Vice versus, uh, you know, a Mad Tom or, or a Smash Bomb. It makes me happy either way. I mean, personally, I like it, you know, pay for my college education for my kids. If you drink Flying Monkeys, it makes it a little bit easier, but as long as you're drinking craft, it's great. I think that converting non-craft drinkers is the most important part of what we do, and preaching the gospel of great beer is great. But I mean, we have to be realistic, too, that there are only certain people that we'll be able to convert. And we, you know, we preach the gospel wherever we go. And we don't just preach it about flying monkeys, we preach it about everybody, whether it be, you know, a steam whistle, a Muskoka, a King, or a Hockley. We'll preach the gospel. We'd rather see great, you know, craft beer being drunk than the macros, you know. And that's kind of our philosophy. We don't necessarily try to, um, you know, bang door to door. It's just too much horsepower. And we, in a craft brewery, you know, we're wearing so many hats, and we're, you know, just continually uh, just so busy with all the moving parts. It's pretty tough to, to convert one person after the next. So we, we do the best we can with the limits that we have. Like all tours, our brewery tour ends up in the store, just like Disney. That's sort of my little. Flying Monkeys commercial there.